morning, so good morning, thank you very much. And uh, before I start, just a reminder of the structure of our, our laboratory. So Nick and I, we co-direct uh, co the lab. The laboratory is on the fourth floor. We are specialized in intraocular lenses, but also it can be any kind of uh, ocular implantable uh, devices. So uh, we are going to talk about IOL power adjustment by centosecond laser. And last year, one of our fellows actually briefly presented about this subject because we had a small experience with uh, this project at the time. However, since then we have been working much more on that, so I wanted to provide you with an update. And because in this presentation we are going to talk about IOL adjustable technologies, I would like to acknowledge that our laboratory performed contract research studies with at least three companies dealing with this subject, which are Perfect Lens, Calicon Vision, and Clarvista. So uh, in 2014, we published this review article at the JCRS on adjustable intraocular lens power technology, a review of everything that was available or under development. And we decided to do that at the time because of this particular problem. In despite of uh, the advances in cataract surgery, incorrect intraocular lens power remains one of the most frequent ca causes of IOL exchange. And this is shown by different studies, including the survey that Nick sends out every year. So, of course, a very good solution for this, among many others, but one very good solution would be the advent of adjustable lens technologies. So, lenses that can be adjusted postoperatively to provide the patient with emetropic refraction. And then in that paper, we review everything that's available or under development, and there, there are a bunch of invasive adjustment technologies, but also under development are non-invasive adjustment technologies. And at the time, we briefly mentioned about the application of femtosecond technology in this arena, but we did not have experience with that yet. Since then, we started to collaborate with the company that's developing this technology. And also since then, there was the publication of this paper describing the basis for the creation of a refractive lens within an existing IOL using the femtosecond laser. And even more recently, they published this paper, and we're going to discuss about that because this describes the real chemical basis for all of these changes. So just uh, to start with an overview, the project is being developed by Perfect Lens, is a company in California, and the laser system they have uses green light, so 520 nanometer is the wavelength, and this is a system that operates with energy levels that are below the threshold for ablation or cuts. This is actually very important because each time we talk about that, the first question of ophthalmology is that are you cutting, ablating the IOL? Not really, you are going to see that. So, in a nutshell, that's a very brief overview. There are laser-induced chemical reactions in a very small targeted area within the IOL substance. In that area, uh, this chemical reaction induces an increase in hydrophilicity of the area associated with a decrease in the refractive index. And that area that's changed has a specific shape, which uh, is the shape that's going to give the refractive power. So this all happens at the same time. The laser builds the refractive index shaping lens within that targeted area. We are going to go into details um, in this. This is just for you to see that what is happening is nothing on the surface of the lens, not anterior surface or posterior, is really within the lens. What the laser is doing here is not cutting anything. The blue area is the area that's changed by the laser based on a chemical reaction. So there is no ablation or cut. So starting the day is what happens. This system is based on the IOL being inside of aqueous medium. So if you have an IOL inside of the eye, it's going to be surrounded by water. When you have, for example, uh, any hydrophobic acrylic lens that you put inside of water and you apply this laser, in that targeted area, what's happening is that it's increasing the hydrophilicity of that area 
And in that very small area, there is a decrease in the refractive index. It's a very thin area in the substance of the lens. What I want to highlight here is that uh, for you to know if a surface or a material is hydrophobic, you can do tests like the contact angle or, uh, in water. So you put a drop of water and you measure the angle. So this characterizes a hydrophobic surface, an angle of 87 degrees. This was treated by the laser, so the surface remains hydrophobic. The area, the substance of the optic that was not touched by the laser remains hydrophobic. The only area that, change, uh, that changes is the area targeted by the laser, which is a very thin area. So there is no other change in the IOL. This can also be done in hydrophilic acrylic lenses, so that targeted area is going to be rendered even more hydrophilic. So what I want to highlight here also is that I'm talking about commercially available hydrophobic and hydrophilic acrylic lenses. I'm not talking about a special lens that the manufacturer produced to be used with this system. It can be any one that's com commercially available. So, I separated the steps, but uh, this is actually simultaneously. In that area where there is the chemical reaction and the change in refractive index, the laser is giving this special shape. This is call, called the phase wrapping uh, phase, and basically it shows a collapsed IOL. That small layer that's very thin contains the full power of a standard um, IOL, refractive or uh, diffractive. And you see that's very thin area. So a phase wrapped structure contains the entire curvature of a traditional convex or concave lens in one single layer that's very thin. And why this is done? Because this is the way for you to create a very significant refractive change in such a limited area. So they did the calculations to have a refractive index change of 0 0.01. In a conventional lens, you only get 0.4 diopter of change. However, if you do that using a phase wrapped lens, you get 3.3 diopters of change. So this is actually very significant that you can get such a change with such a thin layer in the substance of the IOL. And this is the recently published paper where they define the chemical basis of this change. So they use different uh, microscopic methodologies, laser-induced fluorescence, Raman, coherent anti-Stokes Raman scattering. These basically are all techniques that are used to show changes in the molecular structure of uh, polymeric materials. So what they demonstrated is that there are photo-induced hydrolysis of polymeric material in the aqueous media in that area where you apply the laser with creation of two hydrophilic functional groups. And then as water slowly diffuses to that area, you have increasing hydrophilicity forming hydrogen bonds and then decrease in the, the refractive index but this is not an immediate uh, change. So it takes at least one day for the water to slowly diffuse to, uh, diffuse to that area. Then you have the change in power. So if you apply the laser and you measure the power of the lens, you will not be changed immediately. So you cannot measure on the same day. <coughs> and then, of course, with this technology, we have to ask ourselves, is the optic quality of the uh, lens changed by the laser? And we did different studies, and I would like to cite this one. We had commercially available single-piece hydrophobic acrylic lenses, and we mm, evaluated them before the laser and after the laser by different techniques, including light microscopy. So you can see here before and after. And there is some water there because the lens has to be in water all the time for this to work. And on the right, you see after laser, it looks like diffractive rings. But again, these are not diffractive rings on the surface of the lens. These are changes in the lens inside of the substance of the optic. So we measure the light transmission through a spectrophotometer and light scattering using shine, uh, shine fluid camera. And we have this device, which is actually an eye module. So you put the IOL inside 
and uh, you can do the measurements inside of water. You have like a cornea, artificial cornea, artificial iris, so this really simulates an eye. And we use a PMTF device to measure power and modulation transfer function. The MTF is really what indicates the optical quality. And it's important to mention this device because there are ISO standards defining how you evaluate the optic quality of a lens. This is the device that fits the ISO standard. This is the device that is used by the FDA. So in terms of light transmission, you can see the graphs. I mean, there was a minimum change, which is absolutely negligible in terms of values. In the light scattering, what you can see is the pattern on the right side of the uh, pattern applied by the laser. So it increased the back scatter inside of the optic substance of the lens, which matches exactly the laser application. We perform many different studies using the backscattering machine, and with these levels of increase, we are not expecting any change whatsoever. And this has already been confirmed by the measurement of the MTF. Again, the modulation transfer function indicates the optical quality. The curves of all lenses before and after the laser <coughs> were pretty much the same. So you can see here all the results with the 10 lenses. And you can see that the targeted change for this study was minus two diopter, and that's pretty much what we got. And you see uh, the change in MTF is like almost non-existent. So in vitro, this works like very, very well. But then, since then, we had the opportunity to do the first in vivo study using this technology. Because you may ask, okay, there are chemical reactions involved. Is this laser liberating some toxic factor, unpolymerized molecules inside of the eye that are going to cause inflammation or toxicity or so on? So we evaluated the biocompatibility. We did the first preliminary study using just six New Zealand rabbits. The study lens was implanted in both eyes, and again, I'm talking about a commercially available single piece hydrophobic acrylic lens that has absolutely nothing special in the material. The slit lamp was performed every week for six weeks, and um, the laser adjustment procedure was performed at week two. The targeted change was plus 3.6 diopters. After the follow-up, the rabbits were sacrificed and the eye wells were explanted for the power measurement and the eye was uh, underwent, was prepared to undergo all uh, histopathological analysis to see if there was any sign of toxicity. So again, commercially available single piece preloaded intraocular lens, nothing special about that. So here you see a video of Nick actually did the surgery, so he's implanting the lens Nothing special about the lens implantation, injection, in the bag implantation, and fixation through uh, capsulorex is smaller than the optic. I mean, very, very standard. And then I want to show you our in vivo setup. It seems very easy to say it's a small <coughs> preliminary study with six rabbits, but month, uh, uh, it took months to prepare this because, first of all, they had to create with a 3D printer a support for the rabbit. Because even though in, clinically, in the clinical situation you do this adjustment with topical anesthesia, of course for the rabbit we had to fully anesthetize the rabbit. So they created a support for the animal and we could tilt the animal in all kinds of directions. They use again a 3D printer. And you see here the whole setup for the in vivo study. It pretty much occupied the entire operating room that we have in the vivarium. They came with everything. They built up the laser there, the whole system, the bed, everything. So it took really many days to do that. And uh, also, the rapid eyes have many uh, characteristics that we can use to evaluate IOLs with the same size of IOLs as the uh, human situation, but there are many differences between the human eye and the rabbit eye. So we have done preliminary studies evaluating the differences in size, the differences in geometry, and you can see here, for example, the size is very different, but look at the corneal diameter, for example, of the rabbit. It's actually larger. So the geometry of the anterior segment of the eye is different, so they had to create an entire interface for the laser to fit the rabbit eye because of these differences. 
And you see here the animal comfortably sitting in the bed and anesthetized. And you can see the interface there that was especially designed for the rabbit eye. And uh, the eye of the animal had to be aligned under the laser system. And the laser has an OCT system to allow for this alignment and also a video camera. So this helps control the alignment of the eye. But of course, this step in the uh, animal study took like a long time because of course it was anesthetized. So we had to do the alignment with the help of the system. In the human situation is going to be much simpler. And here's the treatment. I mean, once you push the button for 3.6 diopters, it took 23 seconds. I mean, it was quite amazing. So then we perform slit lamp immediately after the uh, laser treatment and uh, almost each hour, because after the laser treatment, there is this bubble formation, this gas formation. You see this in cataract surgery, the femtosecond laser too. These bubbles were behind the IOL, between the IOL and the posterior capsule, and they progressively, uh, progressively decrease until they disappear. The longest time it takes to disappear is five hours. After five hours, there was nothing. There's no mark on the IOL, no, no uh, pit, like when you have YAG laser and you pit the IOL by accident. There is no pitting. It's, it's a change almost in the color where the uh, the laser treatment was performed. And then we followed them, and there was no inflammation uh, induced by the laser treatment. Actually, we did not even need to treat with uh, uh, drops or anything. We follow in terms of UVO biocompatibility, capsular biocompatibility. You see the PCO formation in both eyes, treated or non treated eyes, was exactly the same. There was absolutely no difference. Then we did posterior view analysis, gross analysis, complete histopathological analysis of all eyes, and there was no difference in terms of inflammation, to toxicity whatsoever. And I wanted to show you then the power change because that's what's so interesting. That was the first in vivo study. We were expecting that the target would be really off because it was not so simple to set up. And still with a target change of 3.6 diopter, you see that it got really very close. So that is actually very impressive for a first study. I want to call your attention for these measurements here, which are all a little bit different. But then all the lenses we implanted in the rabbit eyes and all eyes, they had a power label as 22.5 diopters. As you saw in that table, there was variation in the power measurements done with the PMTF device. So what you cannot forget <coughs> is that uh, there are current standards, you know, the ISO standards and others, that they allow some tolerance for the measurements of the power and labeling of IOLs. For example, you have a tolerance of 0.3 diopters for IOLs between 0 and 15 diopters. It is even higher with IOLs between 15 to 25 diopters. So basically, if you have an IOL with a power measured as 19.6 diopters and another with 20.4 diopters, both of these lenses will have a label diopter power of 20 diopters. So you see that this by itself may contribute to postoperative refractive errors after IOL implantation, and by itself make this kind of technology quite interesting. But of course, when you analyze the studies, the most important cause of very large refractive errors are basically the incorrect measurements of the biometry of the eye. So I put some slides on the light adjustable lens because I want to make a direct comparison with it. So the light adjustable lens is a non-invasive way to adjust the power of the lens. It's almost commercially available. It's undergoing uh, the last phase of FDA clinical trials. And I know you are familiar with the project. I just want to highlight that with this lens, we need, with this technology, we need a special lens. That's a 3P silicone lens that has a material that's special. It has these photosensitive silicone subunits that are going to move inside of the lens when you apply the light. 
So not only is a special lens, you can only use this one, but also is a silicone lens. So silicone lenses are not so popular. <coughs> if you put silicone lenses in uh, and the eye of a patient who has retinal issues, one day you may be in trouble because if you use silicone oil, that oil may attach to the silicone lens. If you put a silicone lens in an eye with asteroid hyalurs, you may have calcification of that lens. So it, it's not that simple. And then if you remember how this works, you shine the light, for example, in the center of the lens to add power and polymerize the subunits, and by diffusion, the unpolymerized uh, subunits are going to move to the center, change the shape of the lens, and that's the change in power. This process also is not immediate, so it takes 12 to 18 hours for this complete diffusion uh, to, to be final. So in this project, as in the femtosecond laser, you cannot measure the power that you get immediately. You have to wait at least one day. But what is very important here is this. With the Calhoun Vision uh, project, the patient has to wear these special UV protective glasses until you finalize the entire thing, until you adjust the optic, and then if you are happy with your power, then you have to lock in the IOL, which means you shine light in the entire optic, and then after that, the, the power can actually not be changed. But until that time, which may take a few weeks, the patients have to be wearing these glasses. Otherwise, if it goes to the sun, there is, um, <coughs> there is uncontrolled polymerization of these subunits. Also, the light application for the light adjustable lens is also very easy. You put a, a contact lens and then uh, you dilate the pupil and you enter everything in the computer and then at the time we were so excited we did so many adjustment of rabbit eyes and the adjustment and lock-in would take 120 seconds and we thought that was so fast but actually to be holding that lens there for 120 seconds is not that easy and now in the femtosecond laser it lasts 23 seconds for an adjustment that's actually larger than that. And another very important thing is the lock-in. So with the femtosecond laser, you do not need to lock in the power, so the patient can go on and later, if another adjustment is necessary, it can be done. Because the area you use is very thin, so you can keep adding that for a long, long time. And here the lock-in also is not that simple. It's not one lock-in. There are two sessions for lock-in at least. So an adjustment of a light adjustable lens is at least three sessions for one adjustment, and then after that, it cannot be changed anymore. And also you may say, okay, the femtosecond lens is so expensive and everything, but with the light adjustable lens, you also have to buy the digital light delivery system. I do not know how much it costs. Of course, I bet it's not as expensive as a femtosecond laser, but it is also an expensive technology. And another technology we are evaluating that's almost clinically available, is already in clinical trials, is the Harmony Modular System. It's uh, a lens with two components, so you put one uh, base in the capsule bag and the optic is very easy to change. We performed already at least two studies. We published on that. It's biocompatible. The exchange of the optics quite easy, but this is an invasive technology. Each time you change the optic, it is a surgery with all possibilities of complications. So I think if you have a good non-invasive technology, it's always going to be better. So again, to summarize that, we have now this possibility of IOL power adjustment by the femtosecond laser. It can be applied to any commercially available hydrophobic or hydrophilic acrylic lens. The company tested in PMMA lenses and in silicone lenses, and it does not work. But these, especially hydrophobic acrylic lenses, are the most used lenses in the world. We are talking about non-invasive procedure that can be done very fast and under topical anesthesia. Multiple adjustments can be performed. Right now the company is evaluating how many actually can be performed. And also they are evaluating if there is a limit above which uh, the optical quality of the opt is going to change. Because if the optical quality decreases, then we should set up that as a limit. 
Also, premium functions can be added and later removed if necessary. If you apply a multifocal pattern and the patient is not happy, you can simply apply another pattern that has a um, contrary characteristics of the first one, and then this is no. You do not need to use these special protective spectacles, and that's really very important. And uh, what is very interesting also is that you don't need to have a femtosecond laser just to do that. A femtosecond laser can be uh, designed to do everything, the power adjustment, corneal, and cataract procedures. So, I mean, in summary, we are very uh, interested in that technology. We are happy to be associated to the evaluation of it. And everything going well, this seems to be a real game changer. So thank you very much if you have any question. Actually, if you remember in the in vitro study I presented, the in vitro study was a negative. Oh, okay. You can do negative, positive, they already tested, astigmatic, multifocal, so pretty much anything. We didn't do in vivo though yet. In vivo we just did the positive one. Does the lens move when the lasers apply to it? It is so, so stable. I mean during the treatment is 23 seconds. If you look at the video, you can follow in the video and everything. You don't see any movement whatsoever. Everything is very stable because the eye is in the interface. There is a suction, very stable. Two questions. One, when can we get it? Oh, yeah. And then two, uh, will there be like just a software update for any standard catalyst or Platform. All questions very good. Yes. Yeah. So uh, to the first one, they are ready to start clinical trials. They are currently looking for sites. They are evaluating all sites in different countries and everything. And basically, what they have this company is developing is basically the software. So what, of course, they want in the future is that some big name buy them, and then they can incorporate this to their femtosecond systems, and then fit their systems to do this and cataract and corneal procedures, because the precision you need to do this is much higher than cataract and corneal procedures. You know, to, to further that along, um, Randy Olson's on, on their board, as mm -hmm. is uh, Susan McDonald, one of our old residents from Tufts, and so we're writing the protocols right now for the clinical studies, and hopefully we will be the first center to do this. So we're, we're already starting to look at getting the protocols passed and actually do it here. Um, you know. The, the term game-changing technology is an overused term, especially given the hyperbole of our prison administration <laughs> in this country, but this really is a game-changing technology. You don't have to put a special lens in that you have to change from the first. They don't have to wear goggles. They don't have to you know, be very careful not to be exposed to ambient light. You can take a standard hydrophobic or hydrophilic lens and you can change it. And for example, the, the idea of maybe you can put a multifocal pattern on the patient can't tolerate it, doesn't like the glare, the dyslipsia, or the things associated with multifocality, you literally erase it and change it. And so there's going to be issues of how many times you could do this, but this is a very small area. It's between 50 and maybe maximum 200 microns. So it's a very, very tiny area that's done. And, and I'm stunned at the accuracy of this. We're talking 0 0.05 diopters, and especially in light of the data Liliana presented that, that when your standard 20 diopter lens can actually be 19.6 or 20.4. So we're talking the accuracy of the lens you put in the eye may be plus or minus 0.4, and this is 0.05. It so it's bad. incredibly, incredibly precise. You had the question, Dr. Henry? Is this a faster FDA track than normal? Because it's not a new, uh, but, uh, new device. It's just Current technology yeah, and actually Dr. Olson is trying to look yes, into we, some... We hope. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we hope. <laughs> yeah, because the IOLs are in existence, right? So I think they just have to really prove, when uh, it's already ongoing, all these studies, that there is no liberation of any toxin or anything. So, yeah. Just tweet Trump that we want it faster. Oh, seriously. <laughs> oh, we will. He's going to get rid of all the bureaucracy, so don't worry. It'll be much better. <laughs> I think this would be amazing one of the keynote presentations where post-lacing patients get used 
several biometers, used many formulas, even used intra-aberometry, yeah. and then he ended up, up totally off. And this yeah. is the coke. Yeah. And, and so so there, that's the major limitation is biometry, really. So, but you see, in, intrinsically, each IOL, if you are, if you have the label, the power may not even be that one. So there are so many sources. This makes this type of technology very, very interesting. Okay, thank you very much.